OK, so maybe we'll get started and people can trickle in afterwards. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome back. Uh, this morning we heard of some aquatic invaders and in threatening our waters, and this afternoon we're going to learn about some terrestrial invaders and some of the work being done to limit their impacts to our environment. Uh, to start us off this afternoon, we have Victoria Fuster. Victoria works in the Canadian Forest Service branch uh, in Dr. Christian McCory's lab under the Integrated Pest Management section with a focus on native and invasive forest pests. Uh, recently, most of the research focus has been on hemlock willia delgid, its biology, improving detection methodology, and management options. Without further ado, I welcome Victoria to talk on the current hemlock willia delgid situation in Ontario. So Victoria, you can go ahead and unmute your mic and I am going to uh, share your presentation. Um, so my name is Victoria Fuster and I have been with Natural Resources Canada for almost a year now. Um, before that, I actually also worked at the Invasive Species Centre, so it's fun to be on this side of things now. Um, so I'm going to go over some of the work that we've been doing with Hemlock Willia Delgid in Ontario this year. Um, and if you don't mind going to the next slide. So I'm just going to briefly go over what Hemlock Willia Delgid is. It's an invasive aphid-like insect, and it attacks eastern hemlock trees. Um, it feeds at the base of needles uh, on the nutrient-filled fluids and tissues, and it tends to kill infested hemlock in about three to 10 years, but it's actually considered native in Western Canada. So we'll move on. The next slide. So the host species here in Eastern North America is the Eastern hemlock. It's a shade tolerant long lived tree, typically found near water um, and often found with yellow birch and maple. It's about 1% of Ontario's growing stock with um, an average harvest of about 20,000 cubic feet, often used for barn siding, canoe paddles, um, other specialty stuff like that. Um, and Eastern hemlock tends to provide a lot of ecosystem services. Um, it's very unique. It creates a microclimate underneath. It's important deer habitat um, and also provides bank stabilization and shade for streams. We'll move on from there. So first we're gonna go over the um, introduction and spread of hemlock willia delgid to North America. Next slide. So it was first detected in Richmond, Virginia in 1951, which is circled there on the right. Um, and it came from Japan is what we, what we think anyways. <laughs> um, and then you can see here in the color coding that it spread fairly rapidly between the 1950s and the and early 2000s. Um, and then also in this map, the bright green is the native range of hemlock in the United States. Next slide. So since 2000, um, hemlock willia delgid has expanded quite significantly. You can see in Canada that um, most of the southern portion of Nova Scotia is pretty heavily infested with it. And we do have um, some, some locations in Ontario. So we'll go on to the next slide to see that. So in Ontario in 2019, there were positive detections in um, Niagara Falls and Wayne Fleet. And there was some eradication work done in Ni the Niagara uh, Gorge itself, but it is still considered um, active in Wayne Fleet. And then this summer, there were positive detections in Fort Erie, which is kind of right in the middle there. Um, this map was provided to us from CFIA, and uh, you can see that they, in their testing this year, the blue triangles show what they found to be a negative site in their sampling this year. We can move on. So the hemlock willia delgid biology, next slide. So it's a fairly complicated life cycle because it has two generations annually. In North America, um, it just reproduces asexually because in order for it to 
reproduce um, sexually, it needs a secondary host, which we don't have in North America. It's the tiger tail spruce. So typically um, when that generation occurs, it's the winged insect adults that fly over to the tiger tail spruce and reproduce there. So we're only having the asexual reproduction, which also means that it can spread pretty easily with just one insect being moved to a hemlock tree. So you can see here that in these two generations, um, there's one, the, the cistern's generation grows from the late summer through the fall and becomes an adult in like the late winter, early spring, lays its eggs, and then that generation is the progridian's generation, generation, and it grows really quickly. So it's basically in a month, two months, maybe three. Um, we are gonna look into that later. Um, and it grows quite rapidly. Um, and when those ones hatch, that's where we get the winged generation, which doesn't succeed here. The only mobile life stage that um, hemlock woolly adelgid goes through is the first instar, which is the crawler. So basically the egg hatches and those crawlers come out, go to the tips of the branches to the base of needles, insert their mouth parts, start feeding, and that's where they remain for the rest of their life cycle. Um, as they go through their life stages, they develop this um, woolly ovisac, um, and it becomes the location where the eggs will be laid and will later hatch, and the whole thing will go again. You can go on to the next slide for me there. So with that, the signs and symptoms of hemlock woolly adelgid infestation the insects are extremely small, so you're not likely going to see them. The, the largest um, the adults can get is less than 1.5 millimeters, so they're very hard to spot themselves. But because they produce that waxy wool-like ovisac during development, um, it's typically used to positively identify an infestation. Um, in the photo on the left, you can see those typical ovisacs. This is a branch that fell off of a tree during some of our work this summer, which provided really good photo ops. Um, and then other signs and symptoms are that premature dieback, thinning of the crown, grayish crown, discolored foliage. Those are all signs that um, the health of that tree is compromised by the hemlock woolly adelgid. Next slide, please. So as I was saying, um, it, we only need one insect or um, ovisac with eggs to be moved in order for a new infestation to start because they do reproduce asexually. So typically um, the movement vectors that we're seeing are often birds, um, but other wildlife as well. Um, obviously nursery stock can be an issue and wood movement, tree movement, um, anything like that. And then obviously people hiking. Um, that's a photo of my dog and my fiance walking there. So it's very important to um, be mindful of where you are and try to clean yourself off as best as possible. Wear fresh clothes and clean boots when you're going into a new location. Next slide, please. So I'm gonna get into our work on Hemlock Willie Adelgid. We're doing quite a lot right now um, and we have some main goals that we're looking at, which are kind of cover the short-term goals, the medium-term goals and the long-term goals. So in the short term, we're trying to develop monitoring mit and mitigation tools and tactics. And then we are also looking at to identify areas of risk and prepare stands for hemlock woolly adelgid arrival and develop management tools for those situations where we do see hemlock woolly adelgid infestations. Next slide, please. So these are just some of the projects that we were working on this year. Um, there are a few other things in the works as well, but these are the ones I'm going to tell you about today. So the first one is a silviculture guide that we are creating. We are also working on phenology research, which is um, back to that biology slide, um, looking at the exact timing of the life cycle in Ontario. Um, natural enemies research, insecticide trials and detections methods research, which was my main project this summer. So I'm gonna go more in depth on that one, but the rest I'm gonna give a brief overview. Next slide, please. So 
So the silviculture guide. Earlier this year, um, we established a working group with what is now the Ministry of Northern Development, Mines, Natural Resources and Forestry and Silvicon. Um, it was identified through Silvicon group members that uh, there were some gaps in knowledge and gaps in resources for those who are managing forests um, and whether it's larger forests for harvest or smaller areas and municipalities to have some information on what they should be doing to prepare for hemlock woolly adelgid arrival, to protect their hemlock, et cetera. So we held two virtual consultation meetings this spring. Um, one was with the group that kind of manages more of your Southern Ontario um, municipalities, conservation authorities. Um, and then the other meeting was with groups that manage larger areas of forests and they, were, they are preparing them for harvest at some point. So out of that came the request for a guiding document for managing large areas of Eastern Hemlock, and then also a management guide for managing smaller stands and individual stems of Hemlock, which they were hoping for an, um, a sheet or a fact sheet, little package that they can give to landowners as well. So we have started with that um, silviculture guiding document and it is going to accompany Ontario's silviculture guide, which um, SFLs use to basically guide how they're going to manage their forest for eventual harvest in the future. Um, we're expecting that we can publish that this upcoming year, but government things are slow, so you never know. Um, we're still creating it right now. And some interesting stuff has come out of that. We've made some connections with researchers and, um, the Eastern part of the United States as well, who have been doing 15 plus years of research on silviculture and hemlock woolly adelgid. And then we are exploring partnerships for creating and public, public sorry, and public, publishing a management guide that can be used for those municipalities and those landowners and those groups that are kind of managing on the STEM level or the smaller stand level. Um, you can go to the next slide, please. So the next project that we've been working on is the phenology research. So on the right there, you can see that life cycle diagram again that we created um, with the Invasive Species Center last year. And you can see that it's fairly generic. We just have winter, spring, summer, fall. And that's because we don't really understand the timing, the cues that we are going to see in Canada. Um, so we started this summer collecting twigs from the Harold Mitchell site, which is in Wayne Fleet. We worked with um, some former students from Niagara College who had been doing a school project in there and were familiar with the site. And we were able to hire them on as contractors to go and get us twig samples weekly from June until October. Um, we've also established a partnership um, with Niagara College for 2022 collection. And we are beginning to process the lab samples. So unfortunately we don't have any results yet, but hopefully soon we'll start being able to get in there and um, break open these ovisacs and see what life stages we were seeing at different collection times. For 2022, um, like I said, we're, having, we're gonna be working with Niagara College. They are going to have two groups working on this project so that they can go out twice a week and do some twig collection for us. And they're going to hopefully be able to process samples as well as a school project. Um, and we're hoping to complete processing of all of the 392 samples we have from this year as well, um, and establish a firmer timing of the HWA life cycle in Ontario. I imagine that we will be continuing this into the future um, to try and narrow it down a little bit firmer um, for what we can expect in Ontario. Next slide, please. So the, another cool project we were working on this summer was natural enemies research. This is in conjunction with work that is happening in both British Columbia and um, Nova Scotia to basically determine um, of known natural predators for hemlock woolly adelgid, um, what we already have existing on sites 
um, to see if we will have any natural protection for our hemlock trees at all. Um, and then obviously that can then be explored as a biocontrol option in the future. So we did a lot of field work sampling this summer. We did, visited four sites in Algoma weekly and one site in each of Muskoka, London and Hamilton every four weeks. Um, and then we also had those same contractors that were working on the phenology work sample in the infested site in Wayne Fleet. Um, so uh, my colleague who's an entomologist has been going through all of those samples and it'll be really interesting once they've all been processed to see what we are seeing on our hemlocks in Ontario. And if anything is already existing um, that is a natural predator. The known predators are uh, Leucotaraxis argenticolis and Pinaperda, and they're two silver fly, fly species, and then also Laracobius beetles. So those are the main ones that we're looking for, but we're also just trying to see what is existing on these hemlocks. Um, if there's a difference in what we're seeing um, for natural enemies in the infested site versus sites that do not have hemlock lily adelgid yet. Um, and then comparing that with what we're seeing in the Western part of Canada and in Nova Scotia. Next slide, please. So the insecticide trials actually started in 2020. It was the one thing that our lab was able to get out and start because they were first looking at Zytec in the Petawawa Research Forest to basically evaluate its fate and translocation in hemlock. So the environmental impacts involved with using this particular um, insecticide on hemlock trees. Um, this year, this fall, actually, it just occurred a couple of weeks ago. We worked in those that same site in uh, Wayne Fleet to evaluate the impact of the combination of using Zytec and Triazin um, in partnership with Bioforest to see how it will affect the hemlock lily adultery populations in that site. So there was three scenarios applied for this work. Uh, Zytec alone, Triazin alone, and then the combination of the two. So we will be revisiting this site in the spring to collect branch samples. We collected branch samples and soil samples this fall, and we'll be able to compare to see how effective these treatments are in actually treating hemlock woolly adelgid in Ontario with Ontario winters. Next slide, please. So finally, the hemlock lily adelgid detection methods research was my main project this summer. We were working with two um, established detection methods out there, one being the ball sampling, which you may have seen before. It's racket balls with Velcro and you use this giant slingshot to put it through the crown of the tree and hopefully pick up, um, well, not hopefully, but if, if there's an infestation, hopefully you're going to pick up the wool and be able to positively identify whether there is an existing infestation. And the bark sampling method, which essentially just has you looking at the bottom one and a half to two meters of the stem of the tree and looking in all of the crevices of the bark for um, ovisacs. So the goal, oh, sorry, can you go back? Thank you. The goal of this work is to determine the timing of HWA detection using two methodologies. It's assumed that there is a reduction in efficacy of these techniques um, throughout the year as the wool dries out, as we enter uh, another life stage, a new generation. Um, but we haven't been able to process everything yet. We do need to go back next spring to get more um, samples just because of COVID, we weren't able to start as early this year as we had hoped. Um, and then we're hoping that this can contribute to the efficiency and effectiveness of detecting hemlock woolly adelgid. So for the protocol, we, um, we looked at 25 trees total in the Harold Mitchell site in Wayne Fleet. We tried to pick trees that were obviously infected um, with and fairly heavily infected. And we shot five balls through each quadrant. So the Northeast, Southeast, Southwest, Northwest. Um, I'm kind of just curious to see if there's any difference of where we should be targeting as well. Um, and then the lower one and a half, two meters of bark was sampled. We removed all wool as we found it on the bark so that 
from trip to trip because we went every four weeks, we hopefully weren't counting the same wool. Um, the wool was quantified and I'll go into the next slide now to show you how that was done. So basically we found um, on our very first trip, we were hoping to count ova sacks that were picked up, but oftentimes they explode and then you can't really get a good count. So I just converted to um, quantifying it by percentage of coverage. And that was a much easier way. And I just labeled it basically one, two, three, four, five, or zero. And um, as you can see on the picture in the center there, that, that is a picture of the slingshot itself and the balls that were shot through. We would shoot them, pick them up, put them in the correct quadrant, and then evaluate and clean them off before going to the next tree. Um, you clean it off with a toothbrush or scrub brush and water at the end, whatever. Um, but a toothbrush works really well to keep in your pocket. And we did keep any samples that seemed like it might be large enough to um, hold an insect or eggs and put those into vials of ethanol so that we can take a look at them later. And Darissa, if you wanna put your mouse over the picture on the right, it's actually a video and it just shows kind of how vertically we had to shoot for these large trees. Is there a uh, sound with the video? No, no. Okay, <laughs> perfect. So this site has very mature, very tall hemlock. We found that we often had to get right underneath and shoot upwards instead of kind of being able to stand back and shoot through. Um, when you're doing this methodology, you need to make sure that the ball is hitting at least um, two branch tips or twig ends um, in hopes to pick up the wool. <laughs> Um, some were more insect, more successful than others. Unfortunately, because this site is so heavily infested, there was definitely a few trees that we were seeing um, foliage reduction, um, branch reduction as we went through the summer even. So by the end of it, you were having a hard time finding a new branch each time to hit because the, the, the trees were dying off, unfortunately. Um, if you go to the next slide, I'll go over the bark sampling a little bit further. So I took, I tried to take a picture of what one of the ova sacs in the bark might look like. Um, it varied in size. I, again, anything that was large enough, we kept, but we tried to pick or scrape off any other pieces. Sometimes it can be easily confused with um, like spider webs or fluff or anything like that. It's recommended that you wear gloves, but that they are coated in like a rubbery material and that they aren't a light color so that you're not getting confused, especially when handling the Velcro covered balls. On the right there, you can see a ball that has um, about three ova sacs on it. Um, and that was actually a day when it was wet. So it shows that um, even if it's raining or wet, you can sometimes still pick up the wool pretty effectively. Um, and then you can, so, so depending on weather, even if it has rain, because it's often very wet in these hemlock stands anyways with water on the ground, or if you get your ball wet, it, it will still work to, to uh, pick up that wool. Uh, I don't know if you wanna go to the next slide. So just quickly, I'll go over a few other resources if you wanna learn more about hemlock lily adelgid and how you can report it if you happen to find it. Um, next slide. So, We've worked quite closely with the Invasive Species Center in the past. Um, they have a lot of really good information on their website, which is linked there. Um, we've created a few videos with them showing how to do the ball sampling, showing how to make um, sticky traps, a few other things like that. So that's a great resource for um, a lot of your basic information. We also have publications that you can get on our website um, at cfs.nrcan.gc.ca. We have at the Great Lakes Forestry Center out of Sault Ste. Marie, our publications that are done in house are through um, a frontline series. So we do have Frontline Express, which is a one pager with information that was just published this year. And um, we have the Hemlock Woolly Adelgid Management Plan for Canada, as well as a few other tech notes and other documents that are in there. Um, hopefully, 
once we have more information from some of the work that we started this year, that will all be up there as well for you to reference. And then obviously the Canadian Food Inspection Agency has um, an information page with links to different resources as well. Um, and then all three of us tend to offer workshops and conferences, videos, publications, web pages. And then you can keep an eye out for new publications on all of our websites and um, news alerts for Hemlock Willie Adelgid in Ontario as it progresses. Next slide, please. To report, you can report through CFIA. Um, that would be the main way to report um, this pest in particular. Um, there's phone numbers listed on their website or the uh, EdMaps website or app as well works. Next slide. And I just wanted to very quickly thank all of our collaborators because with COVID and everything else, we would not have been able to get any of these this work done without their help. So my fellow lab members in the Macquarie lab, including Dr. Macquarie, Sarah Butler, Megan Gray, and Allison Grant, um, Ontario Nature, and the Niagara Peninsula Conservation Authority for allowing us to use their sites, um, the phenology team and volunteers um, from Niagara College, and um, Bioforest, Petawawa Research Forest, and then our silviculture guide team, which includes staff from the NDMNRF and Silvicon. And that's all. Thank you very much. If you have any questions, I will do my best to answer them. <laughs> I will preface that I am not an entomologist, so. <laughs> Thank you so much, Victoria. That was uh, very informative. Um, we do have one question. Are there any signs and symptoms that are commonly confused with the wool of the egg sacs? Um, I don't know for sure. I did find when we were doing our sampling that sometimes you can get pieces of moss or bark that depending on the time of year can look a little bit like ovisacs, but it is very distinctive. If you turn over the branch tip, um, you will, and if it is, if you can reach them anyway, some of these trees are huge. Um, the wool is quite bright, especially in the spring. Um, that's typically the recommended time to look for it is in the springtime. Um, but yeah, it, it, as far as I know, there's no real lookalikes that you're going to find on hemlock itself. Um, there's other like woolly adelgid species that affect other trees. But if you're looking at a hemlock and you see that it is most likely hemlock woolly adelgid. And even if it's just suspicion, please report it. Somebody will go out and confirm it um, either by looking at the tree or taking a sample, bringing it back to the lab and looking at it under a microscope. I gotta unmute my mic. Perfect, thank you. Um, for all the young professionals that are on the call, where is the best place to look for job opportunities with Natural Resources Canada, either as a summer student or looking for uh, job opportunities afterwards? Um, so definitely apply through FSWEP. I know that my lab in particular tends to start the hiring process there. Um, so make sure that you, when you apply through there, that you check off um, all of the relevant boxes if you're interested in natural resources. Um, and then your name should pop up if you qualify for um, a summer student position. Otherwise, you can always look at the Canadian government jobs board. There's always new things being posted there. Um, applying to government can be very intimidating. So don't let it intimidate you. Um, hone in your resume and cover letter. There's going to be a lot of questions that you have to answer when you apply. Um, and you can always, if you know anybody and you can reach out to them for help on um, applying to these government positions, it's always good. And network, 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 network. If you have an opportunity to go to an event and meet people in real life, do that, volunteer. Um, it all helps to help you get a foot in the door, get your name out there and express your interest in this field. Absolutely. And I can't wait for more in-person opportunities for networking. <laughs> for sure. Well, thank you so much, Victoria. Um, the you. interest of time, we're going to uh, move along. But uh, Victoria, will you be sticking around to the end of the session? Yes. Excellent. So at the end of the session, we will have some extra minutes to answer any burning questions that didn't get answered. 
All right. So next we have Dr. Ian Jones, a postdoctoral uh, research fellow working with the Smith Forest Health Lab and Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada. His research focuses on the ecology of insect to in insect or insect to plant interactions. And today he'll be talking to us about a global collaboration for the biological control of invasive knotweed. So I will turn it over to you, Ian. You can unmute your mic. And I am just going to share your presentation. Thank you. <clears throat> Let me know if you can hear me okay. I can hear you. I'm sure everybody else can as well. All right. Okay. Perfect. Well, thank you, everyone. Um, so I'm going to talk today about um, an international collaboration for uh, biological control of invasive knotweed. Um, and this is a collaboration that's been going on for nearly 20 years now. Um, and I've been really lucky in the last few years to, to be a small part of that collaboration. So I work predominantly at the University of Toronto now in the lab of Dr. Sandy Smith. Um, but I also work closely with uh, Robert Boucher, who's a, a lead scientist at um, Agriculture Canada. And I'm currently working kind of on secondment in the UK um, at a place called CABI. So CABI is the Centre for Agriculture and Biosciences International. And CABI have centres uh, all over the world, really, that focus on, among other things, the control of invasive species. And it's all of these people um, and all of these centres, um, among other people, that have come together for the So just to give you a, a general preview of the, my presentation, I'm going to kind of introduce invasive knotweed, talk a bit about uh, why we should care about it. And then I'll give you uh, an introduction briefly to classical biological control. Um, then I'll give a, a historical timeline of the biological control program for invasive knotweed. And off the back of that, talk about some of our recent research findings, as well as some future directions. Um, some things that we're quite excited about moving forward. And hopefully I'm going to couch all of that in this idea that really it's this kind of broad scale collaboration um, that's pushing this control program forward. Okay, next slide, please. So this slide just shows the range of, of knotweed, the native range on the right being Japan and um, parts of Eastern China. Um, and then the two kind of centers of the invasive range, that's kind of Northwestern Europe and North America um, along the east and the west coast. So next slide. So you might notice that I've just used the term knotweed until now rather than Japanese knotweed, which might be the term that you're more familiar with. Um, and that's actually because uh, throughout the invasive range, Invasive knotweed is actually a complex of species that includes Japanese knotweed, which is the one on the right here. Um, it also includes the much larger leaved uh, giant knotweed. And then the third species, bohemian knotweed, is a hybrid of the two. So we have uh, certainly in Canada, predominantly Japanese knotweed, but the other species are present. Um, in Europe, there's a slightly higher prevalence of the bohemian knotweed. But the, re the relevance of having these different species and the way that we approach them will become clearer uh, later on in the talk. So uh, next slide, please. So why should we care about invasive knotweed? I know I'm kind of preaching to the choir here a bit, um, but the same reasons that we care about most invasive plants, biodiversity being a huge one, uh, knotweed, as you see from this picture, uh, generates these huge kind of monoclonal stands that eliminate virtually all other vegetation, either through excessive shading or uh, lots of leaf drop that prevent establishment of other plants. And those, that loss of plant biodiversity obviously has cascading effects on insect assemblages and other fauna as well. An additional issue with uh, knotweed is that it grows predominantly in riparian areas, um, lots of the invasive uh, knotweed is along the banks of rivers. Um, and although it has really robust roots, they're not very fibrous. And so they allow a lot of soil erosion, more so than most native plants. And that leads to, to kind of reductions in water quality um, that affect uh, the economy, but also affect uh, aquatic fauna as well. 
So finally, there's infrastructure, uh, this robust root system of knotweed can grow through almost any substrate. So we see it here growing through tarmac and on rare occasions growing into people's homes. So all of these things kind of add up to a huge um, economic and ecological cost to society. So yeah, next slide, please. So that economic cost is well summed up by this quote from one of the lead developers from the London Olympic site in 2012. And he said that the site has been a challenge. We've identified unexploded wartime bombs and Japanese knotweed, the bombs we can deal with. And what he's referring to in that quote is a patch of about four hectares of knotweed that were found on the site that ended up costing the developers around 65 million pounds. And that comes from delays to building, plants growing through uh, parts of the infrastructure, uh, but also the heavy machinery that's required to remove the root systems of this plant, as well as soil sieving techniques and chemical treatments to get rid of any last fragment of root material that would otherwise just give rise to a whole new infestation. So this is a really costly plant to get rid of. All right, next slide, please. So in terms of our options for treatments, we have uh, much the same as we do for many invasive plants um, on the traditional treatment side. So we can use herbicides, which are effective on the above ground plant parts, but they're labor intensive, very expensive, not really feasible on the scale of the infestation, but they're also unsafe in many settings. So we saw the knotweed stand growing along a riverbank. Clearly we can't spray chemical herbicides in those situations. There are alternative delivery methods that we can use to get around some of those safety issues. So the picture you see on the bottom there is a stem injection that can be used to treat individual plants. And although they're effective, again, it's not really something that's feasible on a landscape scale. Next slide, please. So the other potential um, treatment option is manual removal. So we can cut the above ground plant parts fairly easily. Uh, the picture on the top there is a site that was cut back uh, to ground level midway through the growth season. And by the end of that growth season, we had stems uh, returning on that site that were six, seven feet tall. And they return much, much faster than any other native plants, all because the, the sheer amount of photoassimilates that the plant will accrue in the root system is so ready to just, to just throw up new shoots. The only way really to remove knotweed uh, manually is to get rid of the whole root system. And as I touched on, that requires heavy machinery. The roots are very woody, sometimes three to four inches thick in places. Um, and any root fragments left behind will result in, in new plants growing. So clearly there's a critical need for additional control options to supplement what we already have. And biological control really is, uh, is the only long-term sustainable solution and something that we see very much not as a silver bullet but another tool in the toolkit that can help us address this plant uh, in situations where uh, the traditional methods just aren't going to cut it. So next slide. So to give a, a little background of biological control, first of all uh, the control program for invasive knotweed goes back around 20 years and very quickly in that program one insect uh, came to the forefront as the major contender um, to be the agent of choice, and that was Aphalara itadorius, small psyllid uh, that you can just see pictured on this slide. So it's a sap sucking insect, a tiny kind of plant hopper type bug, uh, but in its adult stage and its nymphal stage, it saps to suck from leaves and, and stems of knotweed species. So for anyone who doesn't know, biological control is the use of organisms, insects in this case, to suppress and introduce pests. And the rationale behind it is that many weeds that become invasive, become invasive in part because they've been separated from their natural herbivores, their natural enemies. And so that advantage they gain from not having any enemies allows them to thrive and, and take over uh, many of these habitats. So the idea is that biocontrol will reunite uh, those plants with their enemies and hopefully knock them back enough to allow native plants to regain a foothold. The great things about biological control is that it's self-sustaining. Um, so once the insects are established, they'll 
reproduce themselves and they'll even track the host. It's cost effective, although there are high costs associated with developing a biological control agent. Once it's established and successful, um, the running costs are very, very low. Um, so compared to things like uh, respraying with herbicides every year, uh, the costs are absolutely tiny. And lastly, it's host specific. So we work very hard to make sure that these insects will only feed uh, on the target weed. And I'll talk about that a little bit more later. But as a result of that, the environmental impacts are much lower than things like herbicides and manual cutting. Okay, next slide. So any weed biological control program will have roughly seven stages. And I'll just very quickly go through what those stages are. So it begins with understanding when a weed is becoming invasive rather than just non-native and being aware of some of the interactions um, that will dictate that. Then there's foreign exploration um, to try and identify potential biological control agents in the native range. And then by far uh, the most time consuming aspect is the risk assessment phase. So this is understanding the biology of a candidate biological control agent and testing its host specificity to make sure it's only going to feed on the plant that we're targeting. And once we're happy with that, there's petitioning uh, different areas to release and so on. But the part of uh, the biological control program that I work on is the post-release aspect. So once an insect has been released, we need to monitor it to determine whether it's become established and how much impact it's having on the invasive plant. And if it hasn't become established, or if it's not having any impact, what are some of the reasons that might be causing that? What are some of the hurdles to establishment that we might be able to help the insect overcome? All right, next slide, please. So this is just a historical timeline of the biological control program for invasive knotweed. So in 2004, um, we collected the psyllid for the first time in the southern island of Japan from a place called Kyushu. And in 2008, we were in a position to start extensive host range testing. So the insects are initially brought into quarantine labs, uh, which are highly secure, and they're offered a wide range of plants, starting with plants that are closely related to knotweed, and then expanding out to slightly less well-related plants but plants that might have economic importance or cultural significance in the introduced range. And this is all to uh, assure us that the insect will only feed on knotweed and won't be a threat to any non-target plants. By 2012, we were satisfied with that and we uh, sent the petition to release the insect in North America. That was approved in 2014 and initial releases were carried out in Canada. Releases in the US, uh, approval to release the insect was delayed in the US somewhat, and releases didn't start till 2020. Uh, but by this point, we've ramped up the release numbers and we released 34,000 of these psyllids across the US in the summer of 2020. Unfortunately, in this program so far, we've seen no successful establishment of this insect in release sites in North America. So the research is really clicking into gear at this point to try and answer the questions of why that might be and how can we help the insect uh, establish itself. Uh, next slide. <clears throat> so to get to the, the bottom of some of those questions, I just want to quickly um, describe the life cycle of the insect. So females will lay eggs in early spring and the resulting nymphs will go through five nymphal stages and emerge as adults. And that's the, that process takes around 30 days. And so we should expect to see multiple generations of these insects um, in field sites across the US and Canada. At the end of the summer, as the days start to get shorter and the temperature drops, the adult psyllids uh, enter a diaphore phase where they will stop laying eggs and they'll turn a darker shade. Um, and then they actually overwinter as adults. So it's that adult stage that tucks itself into crevices in trees and between leaves and the litter layer and just sits it out over the winter. Uh, next slide, please. So in terms of our release strategy, uh, what we've been doing mostly is releasing diapores adults. So this is a kind of flow diagram that should start in the middle, uh, but I took some of the animations out. But if you look from the middle here, 
we're rearing psyllids uh, in the lab and then transferring them to lower temperatures and lower day lengths to put them into diapause and then releasing thousands of those diapause adults into the field. So the great news is that we're seeing successful overwintering of those insects, um, which is a huge obstacle when we're releasing an insect into a place like, uh, like Ontario. We have quite severe winters. So it's great to see those insects surviving those winters very easily. We then see successful egg laying in the spring, which is also really good news. We don't have any synchronization issues there. The adults are active and laying eggs at the right time. So the eggs are being laid on the newly kind of sprouting material, uh, the newly sprouting foliage in spring. But what happens then is that we initially see lots of nymphs on the plant, but quickly over the next couple of weeks, those nymphs kind of disappear and the population is gone. So what seems to be happening is that we're losing these populations at the nymphal stage. There's something about our release sites and the insects that we're releasing that's not allowing those nymphs to survive through that, through that development process. Next slide, please. So that's really given rise to most of our research questions over the last couple of years. We've been rearing these insects since 2004 in the greenhouse and seeing the insects perform brilliantly on our, our plants in the greenhouse. So what's the big difference between the situation that we're giving them there and the situation we're putting them in the field? The first one of those things would be predators. Clearly there are native predators that these insects are exposed to in the field that they haven't been exposed to for the 14 years of captive rearing. The other thing I wanted to look into was the effects of long-term captive rearing. Is there anything we're doing during this 14 years of captive rearing that is selecting for insects that are less well adapted to survive out in the field? And there's certain ways that we wanted to try and get to the bottom of that question. So next slide, please. So to answer the first question regarding predation, we grew knotweed plants in the greenhouse and exposed them to the psyllids. So we aspirated the psyllids into these centrifuge tubes and then put them on the plant with a, a mesh bag over the top. So the adults had a week then to lay eggs on the plant and then the adults were removed and the number of eggs and emerging nymphs was counted. And next slide. So then we divided those plants, 90 in total, into three different treatment groups. So these are predator ex exclusion treatments. On the left-hand side, we have a control where um, all predators are allowed access to the plant. In the center, we have plant treated with tanglefoot. So this is a kind of sticky resin that we painted around the pot and around the stem itself to exclude crawling insects. And then on the, the right-hand side, we have um, a negative control where no predators can have access to the plant. So we have tanglefoot and the mesh bag. Uh, next slide. So then we placed those plants out into a field site in southern Ontario. We left them there for two weeks, monitoring every couple of days to see what kind of insect activity we saw on them. But after two weeks, we brought the, uh, the plants back into the lab um, and counted the number of surviving nymphs on each of those different plants. So next slide. What we found was that on those open plants where all predators were allowed access, there was a significant reduction in nymphal survival, but we saw no difference in nymphal survival between those two other um, exclusion treatments. So what this tells us is that uh, we are seeing a significant reduction in survivorship as a result of predation. And most of that predation seems to be coming from crawling insects. Based on our observations of the insects in the field, um, we saw very little activity of ants or other kind of uh, larger predators we might have expected. Most of the predation seemed to come from really small predators like uh, predatory mites, uh, lacewing nymphs, and maybe some spiders. Uh, next slide. So it's clear that predation does have some impact on nymphal survival in the field, but that's to be expected and might not necessarily um, explain the complete lack of establishment that we'd seen up until that point. So we wanted to explore this potential effect of long-term captive rearing. Uh, next slide. So one of the big differences between the conditions that um, these psyllids are experiencing in the field versus in the greenhouse 
is uh, the toughness of the foliage. So anyone who's, who's seen Japanese knotweed out in the field will know that it becomes extremely rough um, and thick and almost sandpaper-like, particularly later on in the season. And throughout the kind of 14, 15 years of captive rearing, these insects have always been on potted plants that remain pretty soft um, and, and kind of nutritious. So what we did, we tried to um, mimic those different leaf conditions by growing plants in different conditions. So we grew potted plants in very, very sunny conditions to generate tougher leaves and very shady conditions to generate much softer leaves. And then we could actually quantify the difference in leaf toughness um, using a mechanical testing machine. So once we then had um, leaves with known toughness, we put them in these little bioassays that you can see on the right. We introduced five early instar nymphs to each leaf using a paintbrush and then covered them up and put them in the growth chamber for a week um, and came back to them to see how many of them survived on the different leaf types. Uh, next slide. What we found was um, that a significantly higher percentage of those nymphs survived on the softer leaves from shaded conditions. So clearly there is kind of an adaptation that these psyllids have now where they're much better adapted to surviving on the kind of softer foliage that they come across generally um, in their rearing system in the greenhouse and in the lab. Next slide. So in um, 2016, uh, Cabby Switzerland, um, another one of our collaborators, went back out to Japan and collected a new population of the same psyllids from the same location. So back in Kyushu in southern Japan. Um, and what we wanted to do was compare the performance of the psyllids collected in 2004 with the psyllids collected in 2016 as to get a better sense of what this long-term captive rearing is doing to psyllid performance. Uh, next slide. So the way we did that was we found patches of Japanese knotweed in the Toronto ravine system, and we cut uh, half of each patch back down to the ground midway through the growing season. We then waited a month for the knotweed to start regrowing. And when we had that kind of that young soft regrowth, we, we sleeved some of it. We also sleeved branches of the mature knotweed that we hadn't cut. And then we introduced psyllids from uh, 2004 and psyllids from 2016 and compared their performance on both of those types of foliage. So uh, next slide. What we found was that the more recently collected psyllids from 2016 on the older foliage that was much tougher uh, and waxier, uh, a higher proportion of the nymphs survived per egg that was found. We also found that on the younger, softer foliage, um, those newly collected psyllids also perform better, this time laying more eggs and having a higher proportion of those eggs hatch. So there did seem to be a very clear um, improvement in performance from those more recently collected psyllids. So next slide. So this is kind of a big um, lesson really, not only for the not weed biological control program, but really for all weed biological control programs, that the process of um, host testing these agents that takes, in some cases, many years, does put us in a position where it's important to go and recollect field lines of these insects that are much better adapted to surviving in field conditions. And with that in mind, in 2019, Cabby UK, where I'm currently working, um, collected a brand new line of these psyllids from a different part of Japan um, called Murakami. Um, and this line was collected from Bohemian knotweed rather than Japanese knotweed. Uh, next slide. We're working with this Murakami psyllid in the greenhouse now. And for the first time uh, since we brought these psyllids back in 2004, we're seeing this really spectacular leaf curling damage. Uh, that you can see in this picture. When you open up one of those leaf curls, there could be up to 100 of these psyllid nymphs just hanging out inside there. And this is really exciting because uh, it's led us to be able to kind of address questions like, to what extent does this leaf galling stunt not weed grow? Is this affecting the plants in much more spectacular ways than previous psyllids have? And it looks 
very clearly like that's the case. We can also, we can also ask, does leaf galling provide the nymphs with defense against predators? So it may be addressing at least one of those uh, issues that's been preventing establishment. And finally, is nymphal nutrition or survival improved by leaf galling? And this may well be the case, whether it be because of uh, shelter from predators, but also the galling of the leaves keeps uh, the inside of the leaf soft and nutritious, and the leaves are not able to expand and become kind of tough and sandpapery. And so it seems very likely that the psyllids are much more likely to survive um, on this kind of material. Uh, next slide, please. So the good news is we're now seeing this damage not only in the greenhouse, but also in the field. We released some of these Murakami psyllids early in the summer in the UK, and we've seen them consistently at that site through multiple generations throughout the summer. And this photo was taken just about a week ago, showing really impressive leaf curling damage right at the end of the knotweed season. Um, so it seems very likely that um, this psyllid is, well, it certainly is established over several generations. We feel quite confident that we'll see that psyllid back there in the next growing season. And so this is easily the most successful release of the knotweed psyllid that I've ever come across. So it really goes to show that the future of this um, biological control program is going to be returning to Japan and finding lines of the psyllid that are a better match potentially geographically um, and climatically for Canada, um, but that also are collected specifically from, from knotweed and Japanese knotweed that's a better match for the Japanese knotweed that we have uh, in Canada itself. So next slide. So this just, go, just goes back to the timeline and reiterates that this is where the program is now. We'll be hoping uh, to get funding to go back to Japan and collect lines of the psyllid that will hopefully push the control program forward much more quickly. So next slide. As far as a call to arms, um, <clears throat> an interesting thing about biological control programs is that once the insect has been released, um, I suppose, as you'd expect, funding gets more difficult to, to acquire. And one of the problems with that is that post-release monitoring and research um, can then become a weakness of a lot of these biological control programs. Um, but there is an opportunity there for public involvement through platforms like EdMaps and iNaturalist, which I've heard a few people mention today. So anyone who's a, a keen botanist or a keen entomologist or is interested in invasive species generally if you're out walking and you see knotweed, if you have a look and see whether there's any of this leaf curling or any evidence of the adults potentially, reporting that and having that ultimately kind of um, verified by experts can have a huge impact on the long-term monitoring program for these systems. And that goes not just for knotweed, but any number of invasive plants in Ontario like dog stranding vine, garlic mustard, phragmites, flowering rush. Um, so yeah, I think that's all I've got, um, but thank you all for listening, and uh, I'd be keen to answer any questions. Excellent, thank you so much. Uh, that was really interesting. Biological control is always very fascinating, and it takes so long to develop, as you've mentioned. Um, I'll let some people kind of ponder their questions. We only have a minute or two anyways. Um, I do have one question. If the biological control and insect release is very successful, is there a point at which knotweed becomes, uh, the populations become small enough where the insect may die off and then uh, allowing for Japanese knotweed or any knotweed species to come back? Well, I think realistically with, with this insect, it's not something that kind of, eats the knotweed down to the ground. Um, and so really, in terms of the impacts on the plant, um, the likelihood that it would be reduced in its range to such an extent that the insect disappeared, um, I think would be extremely unlikely. Um, but that's something that we do nevertheless kind of consider when we're doing our risk assessments. So we do a lot of kind of over overspill studies, whereby you kind of you would rear the insects on the knotweed, uh, but with, with other plants surrounding, and then at some point take away the knotweed and see kind of, do the insects start trying to feed on other things? 
Um, and it's to make sure, obviously, that if, if that did happen, the insect would just die off. Um, right. The chances of that actually happening are very low. So it, it's more to kind of restore the competitive balance <laughs> among the plants around it. <laughs> Uh, yeah. Okay, we do have a question here. Uh, what would the approximate cost of one herbicide stem injection application be? That's a really good question. I don't know the answer to that, to be honest. I would hate to, to just give out a random guess. <laughs> so I may, uh, I may have to come back to you and, and let you know what I find out. I'm sure someone will be able to tell me. Um, Is there a website that someone could even go and look for that information? Mm, you might, even if you go on the CABI website, you might be able to find something like that. Um, I think the thing I would say is, you know, I'm, as a, a kind of biological control exponent, um, I'm in no way kind of against uh, the stem injections or any of the other treatments. It's just kind of really horses for courses. Um, if you, for example, have knotweed in your back garden, I would, I would fully recommend that you just pull it out and completely get rid of it. I certainly wouldn't wait for a biological control agent to sort it out. But I think biological control just has that element where it's, it's able to be sustainable and spread over the whole kind of range of problem. Um, and that's where it kind of, that's what it has that none of the traditional control methods offer. Absolutely. And if someone were to have Japanese knotweed or any knotweed in their backyard, and they did rip it out, uh, as soon as you take it out of the ground, is it um, considered dead or is there a proper way to dispose of it? So I think most of the time, if I, if I have excess material, um, I will autoclave it. So essentially cook it. Um, but I think really when you have, if you put it in your yard waste, for example, I don't know exactly what happens to the yard waste, but I assume it just goes on a big compost pile. Um, and that will end up just producing another big stand of knotweed. So if it's at all possible to burn it, that would be the best way to go about it, I think. Excellent. All right, well, that's all the time we have right now for questions, but again, there will be time at the very end to ask any more questions. Um, thank you so much again, Ian. And uh, yeah, thanks for joining us. Yes, thank you. Next up, we have Iola Price, the chair of the Environmental Committee of Rockcliffe Park uh, Residents Association, and she is also on the board of directors of the Ontario Invasive Plant Council. She is a retired biologist, and Iola hosts the annual uh, inform informal meeting of the Ottawa Area Invasive Plant Group, and she just loves to pull buckthorn, garlic mustard, and dog strangling and vine. Uh, fittingly, today she will be talking to us about buckthorn removal and environmental remediation of, of McKay Lake in Ottawa from 1969 to 2021. So I'll let you unmute your mic, Iola, and I will pull up your presentation. Is that working? I can hear you. Okay, well, we'll assume everyone else can then. <laughs> can you see the presentation? I can see my presentation. Excellent. All right, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you. Um, for those of you who were out in the cold, wet, and rain yesterday, um, I am suffering from the effects of a cold. So if I stop to sneeze, please excuse me. So, so next slide, please. It's hard to see, but Mackay Lake, not McKay, Mackay Lake is there and Rockcliffe Park is shown. This is an old map. And I thought since I seemed to have been doing this for a long time, I'd try to use something old. It is bounded, Rockcliffe Park and Mackay Lake area, bounded by the Ottawa River. Uh, you can see uh, New Edinburgh and to the east of us is Manor Park and to the south, Clarkstown is now called Vanier, and then the Queensway runs through there in some, <coughs> some fashion. So my lake is uh, one of a number of natural lakes in Ottawa. It uh, was formed by the glaciers 
glacier melt and uh, there are sediments in there that are something like 40 to 50 feet deep. Um, over the years, Mackay Lake uh, developed from farmland or the, sorry, Mac uh, Rockcliffe Park from farmland into what is now a small enclave of homes and you can see them there. There are many more homes now in Rockcliffe than shown on this old map. Next slide, please. <clears throat> In the 1960s and 70s, uh, an enterprising developer filled a marsh and part of a woodlot on the east shore of Mackay Lake, and his intent was to build more building lots. I have to admit that he was thinking somewhat creatively. Lawsuits followed, and eventually the matter was settled, and a subsequent owner turned over the land, which is about 3.4 hectares, to the former village of Rockcliffe Park. Uh, Rockcliffe Park was uh, established in something like 1836, and it was independent up until 2001, where we were then swallowed up by Ottawa. So in this uh, woodlot, and you can see what, it, what the landfill looked like, some trees, shrubs were planted, and a meadow was, was created, um, and also a um, many of the plants that uh, were planted there turned out to be uh, exotic invasives. They also made a path along Mackay Lake for people to enjoy the lake, um, but the management of the area really faded from the 80s or so. Um, there is also a small gravel quarry, a former gravel quarry, uh, which is now filled with water. It's a rather popular swimming hole and we call it the pond. And it is all part of what is now the Caldwell Carver Conservation Area. It is an urban natural area in the city's list of important um, natural spaces. In 1999 to 2000, I was chair of the city, the village's environment committee, and I commissioned the development of a management plan for the area, and I ensured that invasive plant control was included. So, so then, as I said, in 2001, Rockcliffe Park was amalgamated into Ottawa and ownership of the land was transferred to the new city. Well, that has a lot of implications for what one can do. If you're in a small village, you know everybody and you know the councillors and the administrative people, and you can say, this is what I'm gonna do. And they just say, go ahead and do it. But now that we are in Ottawa, I have to work through the city's consent to enter process. What we can do and how we do it is defined each year. Usually that's a fairly standard repetition. And I get fantastic cooperation from the city's forestry people and the, the parks and recreation people who actually um, are nominally the stewards of the place. But I can't use herbicides and I have to provide liability assurance through my uh, community association. Next slide, please. So here we are in 2011, after 10 or so years, there was still an awful lot of growth. But starting with students who needed their 40 hours of volunteer time, we cut large plants and pulled small buckthorn. And we very quickly learned that cutting buckthorn doesn't, just doesn't kill it. And this, of course, is before the Ontario Invasive Plant Council was even formed. So I mean, that OIPC was formed in 2007, and i have been doing buckthorn control since about 1999. But then at some point, I learned about the weed ranch, and I acquired one. It was my Christmas present from me to me. So the students, especially the boys, enjoy using it. I also occasionally get volunteer assistance. One year, I received a private foundation grant to hire an arborist. And with a winch attached to a chainsaw to pull large stumps, uh, and you can see that in the left-hand picture, the man with the ax is actually cutting roots while the man on the left in the white hat is operating a chainsaw motor that's got a big winch attached to it and he pulls and the other fellow cuts the roots of a very large buckthorn somewhere. So this very uh, efficient machine pulled out a buckthorn that were up to 
five, six, seven inches in diameter, and that worked very well. But later on in our work, we began to focus on removal of buried branches, but we leave the trunks in place for later removal. That works if you remember to come back within a two year time frame. In our area, and I think elsewhere, buckthorn produces fruit on the second year wood. So if in 2010, you cut off the buried branches, you can go somewhere else in 2011, and then come back in 2012 and find more berries. So ideally, of course, then you come back in 2011 and cut or pull the buckthorn that had berries the year before. But now we're to the point where we're just taking out very small buckthorns that are uh, springing up from the seed bank. Next slide. So it does work. Picture on the left shows uh, in 2013, um, one area, a different area taken in 2011. So um, th these are two different areas. So you have to take this before and after bit with a little bit of a uh, grain of salt. But we do replant. We use seeds and acorns, sugar and red maple, red and burr oak acorns, nanny berry, dogwoods, choke cherry, pin cherries, and occasionally, I can plant small conifers and saplings, although if you remember that slide of the landfill, digging is a little bit difficult at times. <clears throat> we also plant herbaceous material, such as Virginia water leaf, ostrich ferns, trilliums, Canada anemone, cardinal flowers, asters, goldenrod, milkweed, anything that's free and will survive and is native to the area. And of course, we always choose sunlit areas for those plants that need it. Uh, this has been a bootstrap operation, not really very well funded, uh, funded on occasion if I can uh, provide a foundation or some other area to uh, provide a bit of money for some larger kind of technical help that uh, I and the students or the adult volunteers can't manage. So next slide, please. So what have we learned over the years? Well, we've learned an awful lot. And many of the techniques and tips that we have developed here have made it into invasive plant uh, management, especially buckthorn removal lore. One thing that really embarrasses me is that at the beginning, I failed to notice glossy buckthorn. It didn't have thorns, so I left it alone. And because the two were actually growing on the shores of Mackay Lake together, I pulled out the common buckthorn and left the glossy buckthorn and then had to make uh, a return to uh, start pulling out glossy buckthorn. So now early in the season, we walk through the areas, cut off any buckthorn branches with flowers or berries, and we mark the trunk for removal later in the season or the following year. <clears throat> We will also identify locations of other species and focus efforts to remove them at a time when they're most visible. And that includes the yellow archangel on the left and the garlic mustard on the right. And then we of course focus on year two removal because that's when they're producing flowers and are quite visible and just before the seeds mature and pop open. Working with students has become increasingly difficult as they have only Saturdays available. Sports, et cetera, have become more important than pulling up trees, even if using the weed ranch is fun. <clears throat> and then of course, excuse me, COVID ground our volunteer activities to a total halt. Although there's some widely um, socially distance based efforts done, just two or three people working uh, more than the, the requisite six feet apart, uh, doing some buckthorn pulling with weed wrenches, but we really had to be very, very careful that we did not unknowingly expose anyone uh, to uh, infection. <clears throat> and that, of course, includes all the people who are out walking on the paths who stop and want to know what it is we're doing. We had to ensure that we stayed uh, socially distant, uh, explaining what we're doing, why we're doing, 
and uh, getting them to look at their own backyards and try and do the same thing there. So what advice have I got for people? If money is available, hire professionals to do the removal of really large buckthorn trees. It's safer and in the long run, it's much more effective. It's very, very difficult to control or kill a buckthorn tree that's four inches or larger in diameter. Read the Ontario Invasive Plant Council's best management practices documents, not just for buckthorn, but for, from some of the other species as well, and you'll pick up helpful tips. And that's where I actually come back and the person who asked about what to do with the Japanese knotweed after you pull it up, well, pulling it up isn't all that effective, but it will start the process. But it, do read the OIPC's best management practices document on a Japanese knotweed, and it will give you detailed instructions on what to do uh, once you pull or remove the stuff from the ground. You don't just toss it in a compost heap. Buy flagging tape. Use it to identify what needs to be removed. I use red for buckthorn, norway maple, or other invasive shrubs and saplings. And then another color, green, for things that you want to retain, like native viburnums, dogwoods, cherries, and maples, etc. And you must, if you're working on public land, respect the rules and report back regularly. It does help the, the, um, the municipal employees that you're working with if they know what it is you're doing and they can report up that your efforts are successful. Count the number of hours that you are working. Uh, I can sometimes log in two and 300 hours of volunteer time. And then if you multiply that by the <clears throat> uh, minimum wage, you can tell the city people I have saved the municipality X thousands of dollars by doing this and we have improved the environment, made it better for uh, native plants and shrubs to, to thrive and we've, we're helping to increase biodiversity. So log in the time that you do and then let people know how much money you have saved them. Uh, <clears throat> and you should also involve students where you can and people in your neighboring communities, they'll probably stop and ask what it is you're doing, explain, take the time to explain and um, tell them that uh, they probably have the same species in their own backyard. And maybe it would be very nice if they would do something about it. Next slide, please. So what's in it? <clears throat> Some students enjoy the outdoors, others just want to get the hours, but environmental volunteering can lead to benefits. One student that worked with me used his hours removing buckthorn as the basis for a scholarship application, and he received four years of paid university tuition, books and board, and a guaranteed summer job in the environmental field. I'm really very proud of him, and he's now doing a PhD. And he got his start with me. So that's my little feather. But if you're applying for a job, volunteer work is just as important as paid work in the eyes of some employers and almost certainly counts higher than no experience at all. It can be hard to get an array of skills through a paid position. So consider rounding out your experience through volunteer work. At Mackay Lake, I offer to teach students the basics of plant identification and some restoration techniques that can be useful in university. At a minimum, they learn to identify two species of buckthorn, the difference between buckthorn and cherries and dogwoods, and what is a poplar, what is a maple, how do you tell the difference between a Norway maple and a sugar maple, why do we remove Norway maples, why do we promote sugar maples. All of this is useful. And if they have to take a biology course, some of it will stick. Next slide, please. So there is some good news here. Citizens groups in Ottawa are now much more focused on invasive plants, uh, especially um, this past summer, the past two summers when people were looking for the outdoors, places to walk uh, where they could um, 
enjoy something, even if they couldn't go to the gym, they were at least out walking. And so they have begun to notice that there are invasive plants everywhere. They are now demanding the opportunity to be allowed to remove invasive plants from parks and natural areas and along city streets. The city for many, in many instances has been somewhat unhelpful. They demand very high insurance costs, uh, insurance uh, policy that costs a lot of money, 2,500 or more. That's a lot of money for a community association to raise. And they also seem to be throwing it up roadblocks and there isn't a consistent um, information flow from one part of the city to another. And so we are now getting together starting tomorrow morning to strategize and find common grounds and also looking for a friendly elected councillor who will help us um, to mount a consistent approach to removing invasive plants in natural areas and city parks in Ottawa using volunteers. And we are looking at other, how other cities do manage their volunteers. And the final one on terms of Buckthorn is that we are also looking for uh, uh, spots to try out Lowside chondro, which is the natural occurring fungus um, that you cut the stem of the buckthorn and paint it on, and uh, that eventually kills the plant. So that is it for me. Uh, happy to take any questions now or later. And my, uh, you can reach me at info at on oninvasive.ca if you have any questions for follow up. Excellent. Thank you so much, Iola. And I do really hope that you are feeling better from this morning and continue to feel better. Um, this was a great example of how a determined individual or community group of community members can make a huge contribution and it may lead to others taking action as well. So that that's an awesome example of that. And thank you so much. Um, we do have a couple of questions. Uh, any recommendations on where to look for volunteer opportunities? Uh, I, I'm assuming the person is asking who is a, a who wants a volunteer opportunity, not not someone who's looking for a volunteer. So Correct. If, yes. if you are, let's say you're a student or, or a recently retired person, go to your community association. Um, if, if you live in uh, almost any town or city in Ottawa, there's a or sorry, Ontario, there is a community association organized or a natural history group uh, in Ottawa. It's the Ottawa Field Naturalist Club uh, in Picton. I think there's a Picton Natural History Club. Just go to them and say, I'd like to volunteer. Who's doing what and where and how can I help? If you are someone who's looking for volunteers, go to your local high school. Uh, they probably have a, uh, a resource person who is, has been assigned the task of helping students um, get, uh, I think now in terms of COVID, it's only 20 hours, but eventually that will go back to 40 hours. And so get, um, get into the school system and say, I can use some volunteer help. Here's what the students will have to do uh, and just take it from there. Excellent. Uh, you touched a little bit on the uh, fungus that you can use to also help in combating uh, buckthorn uh, populations. Are there any other chemical controls or uh, pestic herbicides that you can use and are available? And would a combination of kind of mechanical and chemical control methods help? I only use mechanical methods. Uh, that's because um, at least in Ontario, the um, herbicides that are available that are really effective are restricted uh, to use by a licensed pest control operator. I don't have that kind of license. Um, there are things that you can use on your lawn to kill dandelions or creeping charlie or whatever. But as far as I know, they're not really effective on things like buckthorn or garlic mustard. Uh, so if you have an area that needs large scale chemical control, 
you really ought to, you really have to con consult a uh, pest control operator and um, make sure that the product that will be used is licensed under the Pest Management Regulatory Agency or the Ministry of Environment, Conservation and Parks or and at parks because Ontario has a dual system. Um, you just can't go out and spray something willy nilly. It, it's got to be registered and it's got to be effective. It needs to be put on the plants at the right time. Um, and then of course you have to come back and pull up the dead stuff. And then you know, of course you then need to know what am I gonna plant after? So before you embark on anything, read one of the best management practices documents. It's got good advice about how to plan a control project and right through to the very end, but you're replanting with something and then monitoring to ensure that your control strategy actually worked. Excellent. And can you just touch on how some of these uh, invasive plants are spread or what we can do to just prevent spreading them kind of without knowing? If you're walking in a natural area or even in a city park, uh, check your pant legs, check the, uh, the fur of your, your pet, your dog, or your cat if you walk it. Uh, check your boots. Uh, make sure that there is no dirt left in your boots. Um, in other words, uh, you know, take a little brush, scrub your boots before you leave the natural area because it's amazing what, how tiny some of these seeds are and how well they will travel on your, your pants, your boot leg, your bicycle sprockets. Um, well, make sure that uh, you are clean. Uh, don't transplant plants from one area to another. I do that, but it's from my yard. Um, most of these plants that I'm planting come from my own yard and I know what's there. And it's only on the other side of Mackay Lake. So it's not a great distance. You shouldn't take plants from natural areas and put them somewhere else because you don't know what travelers are with them. Um, you know, stuff can be on your hair or in your, on a hat, on your clothing. Just make sure that you're not taking something away that uh, didn't come in with you. Excellent. Okay, well, thank you very much, Iola. I think we're going to move on now. Um, and then if any other questions come your way or my way, uh, I will ask at the very end. Okay. Next up, and lastly, we will be joined by Jacob uh, Kluza, who after graduating from the University of Guelph and Niagara College has worked in various roles with conservation authorities. Now Jacob is an invasive species program coordinator with the Nature Conservancy of Canada, where he leads a landscape scale invasive species control program on the Soggy and Bruce Peninsula. Today, he'll be talking about the control program and the collaborative approach being taken to control invasive species in that area. So Jacob, I will let you unmute yourself while I bring up your presentation. Hello, uh, thank you, uh, Darissa. As Darissa mentioned, my name is Jacob Kluza. I'm an invasive species program coordinator with the Nature Conservancy of Canada. I'm working out of the Bruce Peninsula. Um, so just before I get started on my presentation, just wanted to say thank you to the Invasive Species Center for inviting NCC to talk about uh, this project and, and thank uh, all of you that are attending. And uh, it was great to listen to the, the uh, presentations this afternoon by Victoria, Ian and Iola. It's great to hear what, uh, what everyone else is doing in the field uh, specific to invasive species control. So as was mentioned, I'm here to talk a bit about the Saugeen Peninsula Invasive Species Collaborative uh, and a collaborative approach to invasive species control on the Saugeen Bruce Peninsula. Uh, before I get started on the program, I'll just touch briefly about uh, on what NCC is about and kind of the work we do. Uh, so next slide. So about NCC, uh, NCC is Canada's uh, leading and not-for-profit private land conservation organization. Uh, our main focus has typically been on land acquisition and stewardship. Uh, through that acquisition, uh, since 1962, NCC and its partners have helped to protect more than 14 million hectares of land across Canada, 
uh, with 2 million uh, of those hectares in direct permanent protection and 12 million hectares conserved by partners supported by direct NCC actions. Uh, in, in terms of a bit more of a local context, in Ontario, we have conserved uh, over 84,000 hectares uh, through that permanent protection. Uh, that number is certainly growing, but it seems like every day. Uh, just recently, uh, a little closer to the Ottawa region, we, we recently acquired the uh, lands within the Hastings Wildlife Junction, so about a 5,000 hectare acquisition there, uh, just north of Belleville. Uh, next slide, please. So in terms of where we're doing the work here, it's uh, on the Soggy Bruce Peninsula. So uh, west of the Ottawa region, we're kind of in the, the southwest portion of Ontario, kind of within the, the northwest, if that's not too confusing. But uh, how NCC does our work typically are we work within natural areas. So the Soggy Bruce Peninsula falls within one of those natural areas. Uh, and it covers, that natural area covers about 230,000 hectares. Uh, the peninsula is a, an ecologically significant area as it's uh, world renowned for its array of orchids and ferns, uh, globally rare albars, uh, and expansive Lake Huron and Georgian Bay shorelines. Uh, in addition, there's expansive forest that's uh, interspersed with wetlands and, and lakes and rivers, uh, which provide enough connected habitat to support a, a range of wildlife, uh, including viable populations of black bear and, and massasauga rattlesnake. Uh, all of those habitats kind of work together to provide a habitat for uh, 37 federally listed species, uh, 39 provincial species at risk, and, and 20 globally rare species. Uh, globally rare species include, uh, you know, ram's head lady slipper and, and species at risk, including uh, lakeside daisy and uh, eastern prairie white fringed orchid. Uh, in terms of the conservation context of uh, the peninsula, it, it's a little bit unique in, in the sense that uh, approximately 12% of, of the entire natural area is currently uh, protected either in parks, reserves, or managed for conservation. Uh, so that includes uh, in Bruce Peninsula National Park, uh, various Ontario parks, uh, Grace Alba Conservation Authority owns uh, numerous properties, and, and then you have your private land conservation groups as well, which uh, NCC falls within. So in terms of active NCC managed properties, we have just over 1,700 hectares uh, of land on the peninsula. Uh, bringing it back to invasive species, typically in the past, NCC's role with invasive species management on the peninsula has been limited to uh, just NCC owned properties. As I'm sure everyone's well aware, uh, managing within you know, a boundary of a property is not a long-term solution. Uh, you really have to look at it more holistically or, or on a, a bit of a, a landscape scale approach, which is, has kind of led us to, to the program we're running now. Uh, so next slide, please. So that uh, control of invasive species on a landscape scale idea was, was the main driver behind the formation of the Sogging Peninsula Invasive Species Collaborative, or SPISC. Uh, so, you know, what is the SPISC? In short, it's a community, community group made up of a wide range of organizations with a common interest in eradicating terrestrial invasive species. Uh, this group was formed in 2020 with the intent to develop a united and well-planned management approach to achieve this goal on a landscape scale. Uh, and, and this program is only made possible and thanks to a, a three-year GROW grant that NCC received from the Ontario Trillium Foundation. So we applied for that grant uh, close to the end of 2019 and we received it in 2020 uh, with our program running until the uh, early spring of 2023. Uh, next slide, please. So I mentioned our focus is on terrestrial invasive species on the peninsula, uh, but there are four high priority invasive species that we're looking at. Uh, those four species are common buckthorn, which we, we heard a lot about just from Iola Price, uh, dog strangling vine, garlic mustard, and uh, big one invasive phragmites. Uh, these four species were, were chosen in part due to their presence on the peninsula, as well as the threats that they pose to, uh, you know, those ecosystem functions on the peninsula itself. Uh, for example, dog strangling vine has the uh, potential to establish in alvar habitats, so certainly wanting to uh, control for its spread and ensuring those, uh, you know, habitats provide uh, the function that they do to the, the, the globally rare species that are found there. 
Uh, similar garlic mustard, you know, can uh, establish an undisturbed forest floors, uh, potentially impacting Laura local flora species, such as uh, a wide range of, of orchid species that are found on the peninsula. Uh, next slide, please. So who makes up the SPISC? Uh, there's a wide range of different member organizations and, and they all play different roles. Uh, but in short, you know, it ranges from those government conservation organizations, municipalities, et cetera. So for uh, government, government courts, conservation organizations, uh, that includes uh, groups such as Bruce Peninsula National Park, uh, Ontario Parks, and Grace Alba Conservation Authority. Uh, the Conservation Authority, for example, they've done uh, extensive mapping of invasive species on GSCA owned lands and they uh, allow for the control of invasive species through the use of herbicide uh, through a, a natural resource exception uh, that they have uh, for the Ontario Pesticides Act. Uh, municipalities on the peninsula, there are both upper tier and lower tier. So, you know, upper tier, we work with Bruce County, lower tier, we work with the municipality of Northern Bruce, town of South Bruce and township of Georgian Bluffs. Um, Town of South Bruce Peninsula, for example, have provided significant in-kind and equipment resources for Phragmites control in the elephant area, which I'll touch on a little bit more. Um, as well, we've worked together with all of those municipalities to ensure uh, Phragmites has been controlled uh, throughout all municipal road allowances on the, the peninsula, which is uh, very important in terms of you know spread vectors for Phragmites. I'm sure everyone driving on, I was in Ottawa this past weekend, but driving on the 417, there's, there's certainly no shortage of Phragmites on the highway there. So uh, in terms of spread vectors, it's really important to control in those areas. Uh, private land conservation and not-for-profit organizations. Uh, for example, NCC falls within that category. So does a group like the uh, Bruce Peninsula Biosphere Association, who's a member of the uh, collaborative. Uh, their work uh, specifically to invasive species control uh, and especially Phragmites predates the SPIC on the peninsula. Um, but recently they've been heavily involved with, you know, outreach and education efforts uh, and active control and, and organizing community events for community cuts, et cetera. Uh, we work with uh, First Nation groups, so there are the Chippewas of Nawash unceded First Nation and Saugeen First Nations on the peninsula. Uh, for example, we've worked with Nawash unceded First Nation to uh, control, control garlic mustard in Nawash there. And, and last but not least, in terms of members, are community groups, uh, and they are they play a huge role in, in the collaborative. Um, there's you know your larger, more formal community groups and, and kind of smaller. I guess more informal groups that, that are doing control on a, a small scale just for a, you know, a, a small bay or something, a couple uh, local or seasonal residents doing Phragmites control. Uh, one group we work a lot with is the Elephant Fishing Islands Phragmites community group, uh, and they're doing uh, huge work in terms of actively controlling Phragmites in the elephant area. Uh, next slide, please. So I've covered kind of the who, the what, the where, and, and the when of the collaborative effort that we have on the peninsula. Uh, so, so why the peninsula? Um, just circling back to this slide, uh, there are a couple of different reasons as to why we're doing this work on the peninsula. Uh, first is the ecological significance of the peninsula, you know, looking at those numbers of federally listed species, uh, provincial species at risk, globally rare species. Uh, so we want to ensure the, you know, the proper ecological function of the habitats uh, of these species at risk and rare species. Uh, secondly, is that conservation context in terms of that 12% uh, protected or conserved by various groups uh, really provides an opportunity for large scale collaboration with those different organizations. Uh, and thirdly is kind of the idea of early detection and rapid response. I know that's been uh, a focus uh, of the talks today. Um, so, you know, compared to other areas of Southern Ontario, uh, many invasive species uh, are not quite as pervasive on the peninsula. Uh, next slide, please. So I've just taken a couple of quick screenshots of um, 
the, the EDMAPS uh, program. So this is showing the distribution of dog strangling vine on the peninsula on, on the left-hand side there. Uh, obviously uh, not much in terms of distribution on the peninsula. So, so really focusing on that, that early detection, uh, controlling what populations are there, but also um, you know, prevention is a big part too. You know? Uh, making sure uh, that landowners are aware of, of what DSV looks like, you know, how to control it, what to do if they, uh, they do find it on their property. Uh, next slide. And again, same, same idea with garlic mustard. Obviously, there, there are greater distributions of garlic mustard on the peninsula, um, but certainly not to the extent if, if you're looking further east towards uh, Lake, uh, Lake Aurelia or Lake Simcoe, sorry, on the uh, kind of the right hand side of the screen there. Next slide. So finally, I've covered kind of the, the five W's. So how do we go about implementing a collaborative strategy? Uh, there, are, there are really four components to this strategy. Uh, first being an implementation plan. So the implementation plan is a, a comprehensive delivery strategy for invasive species management on the peninsula. So, you know, what does that mean? Uh, essentially, it's a, a guiding document that, uh, you know, identifies the collaborative members, uh, the roles that they play, uh, you know, any sort of legislative or regulatory requirements associated with invasive species control, uh, outreach and education goals that we have, um, you know, control methods and services that we offer, et cetera. So it's just that, that large overarching document. Um, and these next three points I'll touch on in a little bit more detail, but we'll go over briefly quickly here. Um, so ArcGIS project, this is a online mapping project uh, where we store all of the information that is required to facilitate the, uh, the delivery uh, of um, the plan. Uh, outreach and education materials, you know, that's focused on increasing invasive species awareness uh, in a general sense, as well as encouraging landowners to participate in the control services program. And the control services program is, is really that the, the fourth and final and kind of most unique part of this project. Um, we actually hire staff members that, that offer free of charge control services to private landowners and uh, only made possible due to the, the grant that we received from OTF. Uh, next slide, please. So a little bit more detail in terms of the ArcGIS project and the platform that we're using. So as I mentioned, it's a matching, mapping project that is used to collect, store, and share project information. Uh, I just took a quick screenshot of, of what that mapping project looks like, uh, which details some of the information that's collected. So, so the two big points are, are species information. So obviously location, uh, stand size and density, site conditions, et cetera. Uh, the smaller box in the, the bottom right corner details uh, you know, some of that information that's collected. Uh, it also includes, you know, who is the observer, uh, whose responsibility is it to control those points, uh, specific to Phragmites, we're, we're recording information that, that's specific to, you know, is it native Phragmites or is it invasive Phragmites and, and the characteristics that help to, to make that uh, differentiation. Uh, we're also able to store photos, et cetera, with that. Um, and the other big part is the, the parcel information. So all of the shaded parcels there, um, we're doing this work on a, on a variety of properties. Uh, so ownership is a big one. You know, is it a partner owned property? Do we have permission to access and actively control? You know, if it's a private property, you know, what level of uh, engagement have we done? You know, is it for, you know, the red parcels, for example, though, that indicates that, you know, we've identified Phragmites is on that parcel or another invasive species uh, and that we have to do outreach uh, efforts uh, for those parcels. Um, you know, a blue would indicate that we have permissions uh, and uh, consent forms to, to control using herbicides on the property. Uh, so all of the information that's collected in this ArcGIS project is used really to facilitate control efforts uh, and communicate amongst uh, uh, different members of the collaborative. Uh, so for example, you know, if, if we hire a contractor to, to do roadside control, uh, we can provide them access to this project. Uh, they can filter by, you know, whose responsibility is it to control, and, and then they can uh, mark that control was completed in 2021, for example. So it's it's really kind of the heart of, of the project there. 
Um, another big part is all of the information uh, can be exported and, and added to EdMaps. Uh, you know, with the knowledge that our, our project is finite, it's important that this data is transferred and, and can be used at a later date. Next slide, please. Uh, so outreach and education materials, uh, as I mentioned, there's kind of the, the two main areas that we focus on, uh, you know, general outreach to increase awareness of invasive species uh, and the collaborative, uh, as well as targeted uh, outreach to secure landowner participation in the control services program. So general outreach takes uh, a number of different avenues, you know, we've done newspaper articles, uh, community events, we have a website. Uh, and we're also in the process of finalizing uh, a DIY video series. So that's a, a short series of videos that acts as a, a resource to landowners to assist, you know, from the start of ID control and restoration. So if, if someone says, oh, I think I have garlic mustard on, on my property, they can watch this video. And in two minutes, they have an idea of, you know, how to control or how to identify, sorry, how to control. Uh, you know, considerations for control, what to do with plant material once pulled, uh, restoration efforts, uh, as well as pointing to additional resources such as the uh, best management practices on the Ontario Invasive Plant Council website. Uh, and then since we do offer those free of charge uh, or free of cost control services, uh, we do do targeted landowner outreach. And that's really looking at, you know, okay, we have invasive phragmites on this property we wanna control. Let's do targeted mail outs to this person, or we'll do door to door outreach to, to you know, increase awareness on invasive species with the, the end goal of securing uh, permissions to control on that property. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> so the final point is the actual control services that we offer. So, so as I mentioned, we offer those free of charge control services um, for Phragmites, garlic mustard, dog strangling vine, and common buckthorn. Uh, we complete control uh, both via mechanical and chemical control methods. Uh, you know, the, the methods that we use are largely based on, you know, the assessment of stand and site conditions, uh, feasibility of control, landowner wishes. You know, some are, are open to herbicide application, some are not. Um, you know, if it's you know, a smaller stand in the water, typically we would use for Phragmites the, the cut to drown method or, or spading if it's in shallow water. Uh, we do use herbicide for Phragmites, both in aquatic and terrestrial environments. There are uh, regulatory uh, requirements associated with that, uh, varying depending on, on where you're spraying. Um, DSV, typically we would control uh, through herbicide use, garlic mustard, combination of hand pulling and herbicide use and common buckthorn, same thing, hand pulling for, for seedlings and herbicide use, typically like a, a cut, stump, cut stump treatment method uh, for, for larger plants. Uh, next slide, please. So this is just a, a really quick screenshot I took showing the uh, a summary of control efforts in 2020 and 2021. <clears throat> Uh, 2021 uh, isn't complete yet and doesn't have all updated data, but certainly gives you a bit of a snapshot in terms of where we're working uh, throughout the peninsula. Um, specific to Phragmites, uh, the majority of our control efforts have been focused within road allowances and along shorelines. Uh, those kind of are two main uh, vectors of spread for Phragmites. So obviously those road allowances in terms of the disturbed area there, uh, and then Phragmites on, on the shoreline in terms of stolen growth. So, you know, every single stem can, can root and, and uh, establish into new plants. So that's a, you know, a very brief overview of our program itself. I uh, just wanted to touch on, you know, the, the program kind of in action in, in a specific uh, location. So uh, next slide, please. Uh, so that location is the all and fishing islands uh, Phragmites control efforts that we've, we've been undertaking. So in terms of background, Oliphant is a, a small community located on the Lake Huron shoreline, kind of within the, the southern extent of our, our project area. Uh, historically, and it still is a uh, important fish, fish production area. Uh, this is predominantly due to the numerous islands which provide protection from the open lake uh, and suitable conditions for wetlands. 
uh, the emergent marshes on the landward side of the islands and, and the large protective bays uh, are extremely important for fish uh, spawning and, and rearing habitat and habitat for various species of risk and wildlife dependent habitat. Uh, unfortunately, the conditions that uh, make these locations suitable for fish spawning in wetlands also make them uh, susceptible to uh, Phragmites establishment. And since the mid 2000s, the majority of the wetland areas have been taken over by Phragmites, uh, and, and there's approximately 150 hectares total uh, of Phragmites within the area. So, so looking at that larger map, a lot of those blue uh, wetland areas donated by the denoted by the the kind of the blue. Um, plant looking layer uh, are Phragmites, uh, is Phragmites now. Uh, next slide, please. So in terms of actual control efforts that uh, have been going on at Olifant, these control efforts have been going on since 2017, so, so predate uh, the SPISC. Um, but it's grown pretty significantly since that 2017 date, and there are various organizations uh, that are members of the SPISC that, that are providing support to this project. So uh, we have the Oliphant Fishing Islands Phragmites Community Group. So that community group are the, the project lead. So, you know, they're, they're doing huge work in terms of volunteer and community engagement, uh, project coordination, fundraising, et cetera. Uh, the Grace Sable Conservation Authority has been involved. They've provided a huge amount of staff time in terms of grant applications, uh, as well as manual control, um, providing uh, equipment as well. Um, the town of South Bruce Peninsula ha has been a huge supporter of this uh, work. Uh, they've provided staff time and equipment. Uh, for example, last year and this year, they provided both a, a large excavator, as you can see in that third photo, and a dump truck in the fourth photo there uh, for 15 days, as well as operators to operate that those equipment for, for the full 15 days. So uh, a large financial commitment there. And then NCC uh, has provided staff time and financial support. Uh, for example, we were there 30 days total staff time in terms of, of uh, manual control in, in all in 2021, similar in 2020. And we provided funding for uh, manual removal using uh, truxers, which is hard to see, but in the second photo, truxers are these larger uh, amphibious uh, floating machines that uh, remove Phragmites. So we funded three truxers working for five days total. Uh, so next slide, please. In terms of, you know, what does that collaboration get you? Um, in 2017, I think there was about five hectares of Phragmites that was removed in the area. In 2020, uh, that number's jumped up to 31 hectares uh, of Phragmites uh, over a total of 15 days. Uh, and a lot of that was funded through, you know, uh, various organizations donating money, NCC donating money. Um, the town of South Bruce, as I mentioned, providing equipment and staff time. Um, there's over 660 volunteer hours that went into this as well, uh, all Fit and Fishing Islands community group, uh, really organizing and motivating those volunteers to get out and, and assist with the Phragmites removal. Um, and to kind of give a bit of a context, uh, 168 dump truck loads of Phragmites removed, uh, which, you know, an estimated 328 tons of material was removed from the site. So huge undertaking, uh, don't have the, the final numbers for 2021, but, but very similar in terms of, of area control and amount. So uh, pretty impressive what, you know, you get a couple different groups working together, what can be accomplished. And uh, next slide, but I think that's the, uh, the end of my presentation. So I, I do have a couple takeaways and I think I'm echoing what, what other people have said today, but you know, uh, a big thing is, is reporting observations. So I, I'd encourage everyone to download EdMaps. Um, you know, be familiar with what invasive species look like, uh, report as you can. You know, my hopes are that some of these larger landscape scale control programs become more commonplace. Uh, and a big starting point for that is, is having a database in terms of, you know, where are invasive species, you know, what levels are we dealing with? Where should we focus our efforts? You know, if we didn't have a lot of that information that was done prior to the, the formation of this, we, you know, we would be a year behind in terms of actual control. Um, and then finally, just, uh, you know, you know, talk about invasive species, you know, formally and informally. 
uh, you know, make it part of people's uh, vocabulary. Uh, I know Iola mentioned, you know, having a counselor that's that's uh, interested in and in kind of uh, pushing the cause, and, and that's you know where we've got a lot of our support from is is local counselors uh, buying in and being interested and, and bringing it up at council meetings, and, and that's really where we get the support we get in a lot of ways. So, yeah, those are I think my two my two takeaways there. So happy uh, happy to answer any questions. Awesome. Thank you so much. I have a burning question. Where do you All bring right. 168 dump trucks of Pragmites? <laughs> yes, a good, good question. It's a lot. Um, so the town of South Brisbane had kind of an unused uh, property where we're able to dump that. Um, a little bit of regrowth happens uh, with the Phragmite. So it, it's there is a little bit of uh, essentially herbicide application that needs to, to happen to those uh, larger stockpiles. But but other than that, they kind of decompose on their own. Great. <laughs> I just had to ask that. <laughs> That's a yeah, lot. <laughs> it is, yes. Um, which means that your program was very successful, though. Um, in your work, are you seeing any hybridization between native and invasive Phragmites? Yeah, certainly. It's uh, it can be difficult. Um, there's obviously the kind of the guidance that's provided in those best management practices in terms of the ID. So you know you're looking at things like stand size, uh, stand density, um, seed head size. So typically, you know the, the larger. Uh, of those indicate invasive, the smaller indicates native. Um, you can look at leaf color as well. You know, when is it starting to uh, go into dormancy? So there, if it's earlier, it's typically native, but, uh, and then you can look at the ligule, which is kind of the leaf, leaf sheath at the base of the stalk. Uh, if it's smaller under one millimeter indicates invasive. But with all that said, it's quite difficult sometimes. Um, there have been genetic testing programs that we've relied on in the past. Uh, unfortunately, those are not offered right now. So um, I don't wanna say luckily necessarily, but there's, there's, there is lots of Phragmites on the peninsula. So we haven't really um, had to you know, uh, essentially there's uh, enough locations where we've treated where we know it's invasive, but uh, it, the lines certainly do get blurred and it's difficult even for people that are looking at it on a regular basis. Yeah, absolutely. Um, how does someone get involved with NCC either as a volunteer or if they were looking to find career opportunities and summer jobs? Yeah, uh, so our website, I think, would be the number one place. Um, we do, you know, have seasonal intern uh, positions, which are paid positions uh, during uh, kind of fieldwork season um, on our website as well. Uh, a lot of the volunteer events are, are uh, advertised and organized through that. So uh, that, that would be the, the main resource there. I mean, um, first step, I think, you know, get out and uh, fingers crossed, we'll have more volunteer events in 2022. Uh, but, but we'll see what that looks like. But yeah, as a first step, um, you know, just, I know, um, Victoria mentioned it, but it is a little bit of networking, and, and you know, a little bit of, of building up that resume as well. Um, but uh, I'm, I'm new to the NCC, I just started in February, but but a lot of the people that work here started as interns or volunteers and, and now are conservation biologists, for example. So it's, it's really just kind of getting your foot in the door and, and getting a little bit of experience that way. Absolutely. And even if you don't know if you're going to like it, that's where volunteering and internships come in handy too. And you can just get a taste for it and then maybe you love it. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. You got you to try to know if you'll, you'll enjoy it for sure. So. Exactly. Exactly. All right. Well, thank you very much, Jacob. I am going to open the floor for any questions to any of our afternoon speakers now. Um, so if you have any more burning questions, send them our way. And I'm going to switch over presentations in the meantime. <laughs> Okay, we have a question for Ian and Jacob. What advice would you give students currently looking to transition into pursuing a master's or a PhD? I, uh, I'll let Ian tackle that since I have neither. 
Yeah, so that's a that's a big question, really. Um, <clears throat> I think um, a lot of it depends on what your ultimate plan is. Um, so, from my point of view, I did my PhD in the US, um, and there it's kind of not unusual for PhDs to last kind of six, seven years. Um, but I really enjoyed that, and what you get out of it is. Um, the chance to to have a much better publication record when you get uh, out the other side of it but there are other options particularly kind of um with master's degrees at the university of toronto where i am uh, there's a lot of um professional masters which are kind of a year long and will give you they'll they'll make you kind of better positioned to get a phd uh, or onto a phd program but they also kind of uh, filter people out with qualifications that genuinely improve their employability and uh, and give them some really good options so i think there's a lot of op opportunities out there uh, and really it, it comes down to what's right for you in terms of what you want in the future i suppose one other thing i would say is um you know finding the right advisor is very seems very obvious um but you know i've been lucky to have really great mentors uh, all the way through my career um, and it's to do with kind of the kind of mentor you want is it someone are you better working kind of independently and having someone guide you in that way um, or do you want someone who's going to kind of set you readings and and maybe kind of uh, push you a little bit harder and again it's kind of it's whatever works for you as an individual great answer uh, we have a question for Victoria now. Um, are there any other forest pests that Natural Resources Canada is on the lookout for, either within your lab or outside of your lab? Um, definitely. Uh, I personally also work on um, spruce budworm. There's other work ongoing with that pest as well. That's native, obviously. Um, Emerald ash borer, there's a lot of um, biocontrol work that is done in my lab and um, some other labs that we work closely with. Um, Asian longhorn beetle, the, the Great Lakes Forestry Center works, it is nicknamed the bug lab in Sault Ste. Marie. We work on a lot of different native and invasive pests, either directly or indirectly. Um, so I would say like currently our focus in my lab this summer has been mainly hemlock woolly adelgid, but it's always changing. It depends on the priorities of um, what is threatening the forest and what we can do and what research still needs to be done. Um, but yeah, it, it's there's a lot of different things going on all the time. It would be too much to list, to be honest. And you look at pests across Canada, not just within Ontario, correct? Yes, yeah. So there are forestry centers all over the country um, working on all sorts of pests all over the place. So um, even, even where we are located, some of our scientists even go and do work in Africa and, and other countries um, around the world. So um, we kind of look at present and emerging pests um, for the future. Excellent. Um, Iola, you can unmute your mic if you'd like to add that comment. Yeah, I'd like to address the uh, the comment to the person who asked about transitioning to a master's or a PhD. I wasn't quite sure exactly what your what what your question was about, but um, I transitioned from one field to something entirely different, namely biology, and I did that by talking to students who were at one university where I happened to be working as a volunteer and went to another university. And I would say, take an evening course if, you, if you're working during the day in something that you think interests you. And in that way, then you get to talk to other students and ask around, find someone who's uh, an interesting professor and then arrange to meet them and talk to them and just lay out what you think it is you might want to do and ask their advice. They may not be the appropriate person to lead you into a master's or a PhD, 
but they can often set you on the right track. So I guess the theme would be networking and follow up and then just taking an evening course to get you started. You Absolutely. That's what I, yeah, you wouldn't believe what I started out uh, for my first university degree doing. I don't talk about it a lot, but uh, I just knew I wanted to be a biologist. And so I just took every opportunity to make it happen. That's great and good for you. Um, yeah, there's multiple ways to get your foot in the door, get experience or um, learn if you actually enjoy a different field. Um, we've talked about internships, volunteer opportunities, just getting involved within your community. Um, like Iola mentioned, going to school just to take one course. Um, and I believe Belinda at the beginning also mentioned, you know, you don't have to have a background in biology or sciences in general to even get involved with invasive species. Uh, oftentimes we need people with communications backgrounds or graphic design or GIS. And it really does take a, a team to pull things like this together. So it's nice that way because you can kind of combine some interests too and backgrounds. Um, if there are any other questions, uh, if you rewatch the recording or something afterwards and you think of another question, you can always send us an email at the Invasive Species Center. Um, or directly towards any of the speakers that you heard today. Um, but I don't see any more right now. And I'm just going to, uh, I wanna take a moment to actually reiterate some of the common threads that we've heard from our speakers today. And that's that you can do things in your everyday life as well um, to prevent the introductions of new species and prevent the spread of invasive species. So it's, easy to be, it's as easy as being mindful of what you could potentially be carrying with you um, and what you can do to prevent unwanted hitchhikers. It's so easy. You just, you can clean your hiking boots, clean and dry your boat before moving it between water bodies. Um, don't dump your bait in the water. Uh, burning local firewood instead of moving it from place to place and always choosing native species in your gardens. Um, and obviously, if you, uh, you can continue to learn about emerging invasive species that are threatening your community and learn to identify them. And as we heard many speakers mention, um, if you see an invasive species, take a picture and report it to EdMaps at www.edmaps.org or by downloading the app. Um, that picture allows experts on the other end to verify that it is uh, in fact, an invasive species and the one that you think it is. Um, we'd much rather more reports that aren't the correct species than missing those reports that were really integral to finding those new introductions. Um, or if you'd prefer, you could also report a sighting by calling the Invading Species Hotline uh, or the Canadian Food Inspection Agency for some priority pests. You can also play an active role in invasive species monitoring and management by getting involved in your community. Uh, one community science initiative occurring right now is the LDD egg mass scraping contest, where you can make an impactful contribution to limiting the spread of LDD moth in your community by scraping egg masses, taking a photo and submitting it to us at the ISC for a chance to win an awesome prize. So to find out more about more information about this initiative, head to our website um, slash egg mass scraping um, to find out more and to find out what the prize is. Um, on our website at www.invasivespeciescenter.ca, you can also sign up for a quarterly newsletter and uh, our biweekly media and event scans to learn more about stewardship opportunities and upcoming webinars and events like this one. You can also find plenty of species profiles and resources to learn more about invasive, specific invasive species. Um, you can also find technical bul bulletins and best management practices that go through all of the different scenarios and options available for managing a specific species, like many of our uh, speakers mentioned today. Uh, there are also some easy to follow fact sheets such as relating invasive species to climate change or the impacts of invasive species to the economy and other topics like that. Um, and you can also look to our YouTube channel to find past webinars that you may have missed as well as some how-to videos for management. And if you missed anything today, 
You will also find today's Youth Summit up on our YouTube channel in the coming weeks. So with that, I wanna say thank you again to all of our attendees on the call for joining us today and learning about invasive species and being our eyes on the ground. I hope you gained a lot of valuable information from all of our speakers and feel free to reach out to us if you have any other questions. I want to thank the Ontario Trillium Foundation for funding the Early Detection and Rapid Response Network and thank the Ontario Invasive Plant Council and the Ontario Woodlot Association, Eastern Ontario Model Forest for their hard work and contributions to the network. I want to thank the Honorable Steve Clark for his kind remarks at the beginning and I want to also take the time to thank our speakers for joining us and sharing all of their hard work on controlling and managing invasive species in Ontario. The wide range of organizations and expertise that we listened to today really demonstrates how it takes a team and a community to work together to help mitigate the effects of invasive species. And it is our collective efforts as an organizations, communities, and individuals that make our success po successes possible. So we hope that you leave here today with a better understanding of the threats of these invaders to Ontario, but also how you can help prevent, detect, and monitor for invasive species at home. Thank you very much, everyone, and I hope you enjoyed the summit. <laughs>